Thank you everyone for joining us tonight for our discussion of Trail Guide to the South Fork and Exploring East End Waters by Mike Bettini, who is joining us for the discussion. My name is Marianne Delacroce and I'll be your moderator this evening. We welcome your participation and discussion. This is not intended to be a lecture. Mike Bettini is an environmental consultant who served for 14 years as a planner for the group for the South Fork. He is an award-winning columnist, a former adjunct professor at Southampton College, a former Outward Bound instructor, a former lifeguard at Jones Beach, and a competitive triathlete. Mike, I'm going to start out the discussion tonight by um, saying that that's a lot of formers. So tell us what you're up that. to now. That, that didn't sound good. That's <laughs> a, I'm still alive and kicking. Though. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what kind of work are you doing now? And what are some of the projects that you're working on? Okay. Yeah, that, that, that goes. So that book was, that was the trail guide, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was 2003. So that's a while ago. So I'm working as a, as a wildlife biologist currently with SeaTuck and Environmental Association. And SeaTuck, their headquarters are in Islip, very centrally located on Long Island. And um, I got to know them pretty well when I uh, initiated the Long Island Natural History Conference, which is an annual event that we host. It's grown into a two-day event. I call it the Gathering of the Long Island Conservation Clan. And we have uh, two full days of, of, of presentations on different kinds of research going on on Long Island. Um, and what, what, I, what I learned was that um, we have a lot of environmental groups on Long Island, but in terms of uh, focus uh, specifically on wildlife conservation <clears throat> and um, specifically covering all of Long Island and not outside of Long Island, for example, the Nature Conservancy, they, they're all over the place. SeaTuck <clears throat> uh, is really the only environmental organization that works solely on Long Island and covers all of Long Island, um, as opposed to the group, for, which the group now is the group for the East End. So they've expanded their region. Uh, and a, a lot of other good, great groups like the Pine Barrens Society, you know, which is focused on the Pine Barrens. But um, so I realized that um, in the last uh, few research projects I've undertaken uh, for example, the River Otter Project. Um, it, it's, it, it's an island-wide survey that I was doing. I was trying to determine the distribution of river otters on Long Island after uh, being decimated here hundreds of years ago from the fur trade. It's taken that long for them to, to get a toehold on Long Island. And even today, I've been doing that work for over a decade there. Um, they, they still really haven't colonized much on the south shore of Long Island. <clears throat> so I think I answered the question somewhat. Uh, there's, other, there's two other study animals that I'm currently working on. One is um, an animal that I had worked on uh, about 10 years ago, the spotted turtle. Uh, I learned that the um, the spotted turtle working group that that's a that's a species that used to be the most common turtle on Long Island, and I bet I'll bet you very few people have seen one or even know what one looks like today. Um, the the people doing that research uh, are setting up long term monitoring sites throughout the range, which is a little bit in Southern Canada and all the way down into uh, Georgia on the Eastern seaboard um, inland uh, mostly. So I have a long-term monitoring site that I just set up this year. This was the first year of doing that, but I had worked with them some years ago. And then I'm also working with uh, coyotes, which are just starting to um, colonized Long Island. Um, this is a very unusual situation. It's a fascinating story of how an animal in our, basically in our lifetime, an animal that um, migrated east 
and 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 interbred with other species, which is a big no-no in the biology textbooks, but produce fertile offspring. And and we now have uh, this this animal that has uh, sixty percent Western coyote DNA, about a third wolf DNA and about 10% domestic dog DNA. And there's a, there's a lot of debate about whether or not we should call that a new species. Right now it's called um, the Eastern coyote. It's, it's a subspecies of the Western coyote, but uh, it's an interesting debate. And um, yeah, they first came to, to New York by way of Canada in the 1940s and made their way down to uh, the metropolitan New York area, the Bronx area in the 90s. But then they, to get over from, from the mainland over onto Long Island, um, it's kind of tricky. You have New York City just sitting right there. Um, but they made their way over here just in the last three years. So we have had two documented cases of them breeding on Long Island so far more west or out this way or yeah, out no um so so there's a lot of great habitat out here but they're they're really coming over from um from the bronx uh there's there's four or five breeding pairs in the bronx hey mike did you read uh, the article i think it was in the new yorker a few weeks ago about coyotes on staten island hmm. um Big, long no piece. i did not see that article but i just i'll send you a link I just ran a, a workshop for um, New York City Parks, their wildlife unit, hmm. and I found a deer carcass with coyote scat nearby. And I said, wow, I did, I, you know, and they, there were four of them there. They didn't know there were coyotes on Staten Island. But then I, in doing, in spreading the word about that, I found out that the, um, a different wildlife unit called the New York State DEC. There's a woman who was uh, had collected coyote scat on Staten Island. I think she may have some um, some of those remote wildlife cameras out and has some photographs. Yeah. Appears to so be hey, just out to Staten Island. They can get out to Long Island, right? Exactly. Yeah. Actually, that would be tricky because it, it, it Staten Island. Is, is, is really up against the New Jersey shore, um, the Meadowlands area, and it's it, the Verrazano Bridge. I mean, if you've been across the Verrazano Bridge oh. to get over to Queens and Brooklyn, that's actually a pretty long swim. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, well, I'll send you that link. You might enjoy. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you, Ames. Yeah. So I wondered if maybe um, you can talk a little bit about an earth science 101 for how our natural history in the area was developed. Um, okay, yeah, that's that's easy. Long Island is, is basically um, a glacial moraine. So um, if you if you were to dig down on mo uh, with the exception of the very northwest corner of um, what would that be Queens. Hmm. Uh, there's no bedrock uh, near the surface. It's just a big pile of moraineal debris that was scraped off of um, New England and Southern Canada many years ago. And this was the end of the reach of the glacier. So if you think of the glacier as this big chunk of ice, but it's melting at the Southern end where Long Island is. And, um, being re moving southward very slowly to replace what's being melted. And it's sort of a conveyor belt. And in the meltwater is, are these big boulders and sand and gravel. And, and uh, as Peter Matheson once said, uh, a lot of nice farmland soil from uh, Southern Canada, much to the chagrin of the Canadians that ended up here. In, uh, in on on the south shore of Long Island, mostly. So yeah, we're a terminal moraine. Out where I am in the East End, bedrock is down over a thousand feet below grade. 
So. Great. So to our participants, we could go in a number of different directions. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to ask them. Originally, I thought we could talk about some of the places that we wanted to explore, or we could, um, you know, either that we've explored hiking or kayaking um, and how those areas were formed. Or if we wanted to have Mike talk about some different conservation efforts, we could do that too. So um, participants' choice in what direction we want to go in tonight. Or Mike's choice. <laughs> Mike, we have a quiet group, so I think it's yeah. your choice. Um, okay. So maybe you could talk a little bit about some of the places that you enjoyed exploring, um, either on trail or in the waters, and just a little bit about how those areas were formed and what's happening there now. Um, when I was reading the trail guide, I actually picked up the book um, during quarantine because I needed to just get out. Um, mm -hmm. And so one of the places that I visited was the Walking Dunes. And I found it fascinating. I didn't know it existed. Um, many of you know or heard me say in the intro, I'm not from uh, East Hampton originally. Um, I didn't know it existed. I found it fascinating that it's only been there for 100 years um, and you don't really know what, how it formed. I mean, so what are some of the places that you've enjoyed? Yeah, that's, that's um, in terms of uh, places to go for a walk, uh, the Walking Dunes is probably my favorite spot. It is a fascinating area and there, there, it's a very diverse area too. So you have uh, the coastal ecosystems because it's, it, it's bordered on the north by uh, Block Island Sound mm. and on the west by Napeague Harbor, which is a beautiful estuary. And, um, and on the south, I mean, not, not that you would walk across the highway necessarily, but from some of the dune tops you can see the Atlantic Ocean it's not even a quarter of a mile away to the south um, so it has all those um, associated uh, estuarine habitats a lot of salt marsh for example and it also is riddled because of the high groundwater table there it's riddled with uh, all sorts of freshwater marshes so we have cranberry bogs um, with rare orchids and these, these plants that can actually capture insects, dissolve the insect and, and, and draw the nutrients out of the insect carcass because the soil is very sandy. Uh, it's dune land soil and there's not a lot of, um, of um, uh, material that has a lot of nutrients and it's really no um, leaf litter and, and uh, humus layer in a lot of those areas. Um, and then, um, and you, you have a variety, you have a, you have a beautiful freshwater pond uh, that you can hike over to called Fresh Pond. And uh, that's a pretty large water body. And you have um, shrub swamps and you have uh, Tupelo red maple swamps. And then you have these fantastic dune formations all over the place. So um, one thing I've noticed about the walking dunes is that it's, um, it's easy to forget about all the ecological stuff in there. It's just a stunning landscape. And uh, many years ago, I was contacted by a woman who was retired from Hofstra a retired professor and she had a, a hobby as a photographer and she wanted me to write the captions to go with all these photographs she had taken in the walking dunes and they were she didn't know anything about the ecology of the walking dunes they were just these beautiful black and white photographs of landforms and um and bizarre contorted oak trees because it's sculpted by the salt laden wind. And I said, you need a, you need a Jackson Pollock kind of person to do the captions. <laughs> but, you know, it is, it, it's just a, a fantastic place to go for a walk because of the, the scenery like that. It's really fantastic. 
You're not even on um, Long Island. It's not, it's like from another. Yeah. It really yeah. is. The other thing about the walking dunes is because the trails are kind of in a sandy area, it's pretty safe to walk in terms of ticks. And um, I used to do a series in there by, by season. It's just, it, it's really a beautiful area to go in the winter, in the spring, in the summer, and in, in the fall. Uh, there's all these different things going on there. So that would be my favorite. And then um, the, one of my favorite hobbies is, is canoe tripping. Um, and while we don't have any real wilderness areas on Long Island, and most of the paddling trips are, are you know, like a day or a half a day, um, there's some really uh, beautiful areas. And it's, it's a vantage point that a lot of people don't get that live out here is to look back on where they live from the water. It's really, really striking. Um, there are, when I first moved here, I did a lot of canoeing around the area. And there were some places that I could have been, you know, up where Bill Good lives, um, right up there on the coast of Maine. You know, it's just really not very big areas, but, you know, Alewife Creek, uh, it's a very short paddle, but it, it's, it's a beautiful spot. And that's, that's a popular one that I like to take people on. Um, and Akabonic Harbor, which is, which is in the heart of Springs, East Hampton, which is the most densely developed area in the town of East Hampton, outside of the village areas. But it's, a, it's really, um, there's not a lot of open space, but the town of East Hampton through the planning process has, has done this great job of, of, with each individual application, they they get a mitigation measure where they'll, they'll get like a wetland buffer um, on these very small properties. There was also an aggressive um, open space campaign to buy a lot of the property in there that hadn't been developed yet. And um, yeah, it's, it's uh, as pretty as any place on Long Island to paddle, Akabonic Harbor. Yep. Anybody else have a favorite spot? A question about a favorite spot? No? <laughs> okay. So then Mike, what do you wish that people knew? Um, or what do you wish that people would do while they're exploring? Yeah, um, yeah so the, 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 there, there's, um, there's a downside to writing a guidebook. Um, and the downside is that you're promoting uh, visitation to those areas. Uh, I remember um, a friend of mine was not was very upset that I wrote. I included the walking dunes in the trail guide. And and I said, yeah, I know what you mean. But when I got here in 1988, there was no trail. And there was no trail guide for that area. And people were walking all over the place. And this is dune land soils. So it's very easy to, to create blowouts and, um, and really damage the vegetation. And, um, and, I, and I felt like the, uh, the, and plus it, you know, it wasn't like a hidden place. <laughs> Every, it's a very popular place. There was a, a colleague of mine, Larry McCormick, who's a geology teacher at Southampton College. And he, he told me that he says, I created this blowout over here from taking my students there on field trips every year, you know, 20, 20 college students walking through the walking dunes. And, you know, we, we inadvertently uh, uh, created this blowout area. Um, so what I did for that is, unlike any of the other trails that I designed out here, I contacted all the key people that led field trips in that area that I knew. Um, even people from, you know, that are based in New York City that come out here and they do a whole program in the Walking Dunes. 
And I asked them, you know, what did they want to showcase? And I, I designed a mile loop in there to, to keep people, you know, in a certain area and we can, we can monitor that and, and make adjustments as needed. Um, so that, that was um, my, my rationale for um, developing a, the trail guide. And the other thing that I thought was important is, okay, so these people are going to be out there, uh, whether or not there's a trail guide, they're going to be out there on these trails. And I wanted to, them to know about some of the really cool things and, and, and what, what to look at in the landscape and in, interpret the landscape. So um, it wasn't a trail guide in terms of use this and you won't get lost in the woods. It was a trail guide with what am I looking at as I hike along here? Like what are the interesting features? And a lot of the, the style of the trail guide um, is based on one of my uh, professors in graduate school called Tom Wessels who um, who wrote a book, Reading the Forested Landscape. And it's all about um, you know, understanding why certain things are here and not there and learning about their, their requirements and where they grow. Um, and also things like, okay, you know, why, why are all the oak trees here? Why do, why do they have like five or six stems coming out of the ground? Uh, that could either be cutting or or a fire. And in, in, in Hither Woods, for example, there was a big fire there um, some years ago. And you walk through the woods there and all of a sudden it's all stunted, kind of bushy looking oak trees. And then if you look closely, you could see the charcoal scarring on the trunks. Um, and then finally, you know, I made a pitch in the, in both books that, um, you know, okay, you're using the waterways as a paddler, or you're using the trail system as a mountain biker or a hiker or a horseback rider. Um, you need to help steward these properties and get involved in the trails groups, getting involved in open space uh, initiatives to protect more land out here. Um, so that was um, that was the goal of that, and and I, I think I think it it did make a little bit of an impact. It's hard to measure that, um, but the one thing that um, I didn't do that's really important is I didn't bridge that to your own piece of property or your own piece of real estate in the Hamptons, and that. We've tried to do a lot of different things to get people to be more aware of, you know, they're a homeowner, they're a property owner, and what are the what are the good things to do to um, uh, to steward their property? Um, so Long Island is, is 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 a glacial moraine. We don't have any freshwater rivers running down from some mountain range to provide drinking water. It's all in the aquifer under our feet. Mm -hmm. And it's a very limited supply. And it's very easy to contaminate. Um, so in that vein, we tried a lot of different things. Like we thought we could embarrass people about spraying their property with harmful pesticides by making the uh, sprayer put a yellow index card on warning people uh, like, you know, along the street side of the property that it had been sprayed. Um, that didn't work. <laughs> people <laughs> didn't seem to care about that. Um, and uh, the other thing that I realized is that related to this, is that back in when, when I was a kid growing up on Long Island, the homeowner did all the work on the property. They mowed the lawn, um, they raked the leaves, 
They took care of the property. And that's no longer the case, particularly in the Hamptons. Um, they all hire someone to come in and, and do all this stuff. And it's, it's gotten a little bit crazy where um, this time of the year and starting, really starting in like when the first little leaf turns color and drops on the ground, which is in September, every week they, they have a crew come in with the leaf blowers and um, it, it's, it's crazy. And they're taking away, uh, first of all, the leaves don't stay on the lawn. They blow off the lawn over the course of the fall. And it's grass is dormant, so there's no issue there really. But they're blowing all the leaves out of the shrubs and in the woods. You know, we we another thing we tried to do was to have clearing restrictions on property, so you can only clear a certain amount of area and then have your little lawn. Um, but the rest is supposed to be kept natural. And the um, the leaf blowers are going right into the woods and, and right around all the, wood, the shrubbery and taking all that leaf litter away. That's nature's long underwear. That is protecting the soil and the soil community, which is alive over the course of the winter months um, to keep it from drying out and to insulate it from the dramatic changes in temperature. Next week, it's gonna go down at night to 13, 14 degrees, you know, and that, that's an important thing to have. Um, and um, yeah, that's taken away. It it's, uh, doesn't make any sense at all. So you mentioned that it would be hard to measure impact, but you said your career has been like 30 years. And so mm -hmm. do you think that you would be able to measure some of this impact on some of the places like the Walking Dunes if there's increased, you know, visitation or... Um, you know, do you think you could see that in 30 years? Like the only thing that I could see uh, that's very dramatic and that is so incremental year to year that a lot of people that go into the, they go hiking every weekend. They don't believe it. They don't because it's, it hasn't changed radically from year to year. And that is the impact of deer browsing on our forest ecosystem. Uh, that's really striking. And um, it, even some colleagues that should know better are, are arguing or debating that, that it, it, it's really no change. So um, I serve on the town's nature preserve committee and I've uh, proposed that we set up three deer exclosures in different parts of East Hampton. One in Montauk, one in the Springs Amagansett area and one in the Wayne Scott Northwest area. That um, of course, this has gotta be a, a, a fairly large exclosure, um, like an acre or two would probably be the minimal size and it would be expensive to do um, but it will last a long time. We'd have to do the same thing that the farmers do to keep deer out of the agricultural area. But um, it would be a great educational tool for people to see what exactly is going on in the forest understory. And this is a, this is a very uh, important habitat for things that have disappeared from East Hampton, like the Whippoorwill. I'm not saying that that's the reason why they disappeared, but there's, there's a lot of birds that nest on the ground in that shrub community. The shrub community is gone in a lot of areas. Um, box turtles, uh, that's, that's their habitat really. I mean, they can wander around the lawn and, and, and survive um, eating stuff in your compost pile in your backyard. But um, when they're looking to hibernate for about six months of the year, you know, they got to get into these areas that have leaf litter <laughs> um, to burrow into. And that shrub community is also very important. So, um, yeah, I'm hoping that will, um, the, the committee has approved the idea. It's just a, it's kind of slow going getting the town to move ahead with it. What are some of the other 
conservation efforts that the town is doing? Well, um, you know, we I'm, I'm kind of I kind of started off on um, a negative track there, but um, there's some amazing things going on right now. Uh, I have I mentioned that I'm studying river otters, and there's I would say probably 90% of Long Islanders have no idea that there are river otters on Long Island. This is a species that was eliminated from a lot of North America, along with the beaver and some other fur bears, from very simple rudimentary traps uh, during the fur trade era, starting in the mid 1600s. And the first conservation laws to protect these species didn't get implemented until the early 1900s. So that's, um, that's almost a century. And yet the otter in, and, and the beaver, that they, they've just made a comeback in some of these areas. And a lot of, a lot of areas, they actually um, captured otters from areas that had a healthy population and transplanted them to help them out. Uh, but anyway, the, um, when I started the study in 2008, there was no information on their distribution on Long Island. And uh, looking at what I found in that first year, um, they had a foothold in the Oyster Bay area. And then there was one otter that I um, monitored with camera traps on the east end of Long Island, centered around um, Greenport and uh, Shelter Island mostly. But I think they actually started breeding here uh, sometime around the, the mid 1990s. And um, they're slowly, even though they get, a lot of them are getting hit by cars, you know, we have just the road system here is pretty tricky for something like that. Um, they are expanding their distribution on the island. They've, they've just made their way onto the South shore recently. So, um, so that's really um, kind of exciting. And then the bald eagle, uh, a kind of a similar situation. They were, they were really harmed significantly with pesticide use along with the osprey. And um, they've made a big comeback. The first one that nested on the Long Island area was on Gardner's Island. That was around, uh, that must be, uh, I think it was around 2006, 2007. And then now, now when you see, used to be a big deal to see an immature bald eagle. We never saw an adult bald eagle back in the early 90s. And people see them all the time now. <laughs> I, I don't even know how many nests we have, but on the East End, I know of uh, four different nests right here on the South Fork. So, um, and then we're also um, one of Sea Tuck's big projects is to restore uh, spawning access for river herring, things like alewives, and um, they're slowly expanding. And and that 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 that's that's a lot of either fish ladders or dam removals, and they're making you know good headway with that. And, um, and most of the people um, that are viewing this probably know of the, um, the resurgence of Menhaden, it's also known as Bunker, puts on this uh, incredible display out here in the summer. And uh, yeah, I was, I, you mentioned I was a lifeguard. So I used to sit in a chair high up off the beach and stare at the water for hours every summer from Memorial weekend to Labor Day weekend. So 1978, uh, 19, 1974 to um, uh, 1988. Never saw a whale, never saw a bunker, um, never saw a dolphin. And you can just sit down on your beach chair any day in the summer on Long Island and see humpback whales putting on a show. It's incredible. So uh, 
we we don't have the uh, the specific data uh, to show what happened to the bunker in the 1960s when the the bunker fishery on Long Island collapsed. 1965, the last Menhaden factory uh, closed up, but we. We surmise that that they were overfished. It's very easy to to uh, they're, they're in very dense schools. It's very easy to corral a whole school and haul them in, and there were no restrictions. Um, and it was a valuable fish in terms of uh, the oil that you could get out of the fish. And then what was left over was made into uh, cattle feed or um, pet food. So um, yeah, they were they were gone for a half a century, and they've come back, and um, you know it's it's really changed the marine ecosystem dramatically. So there are some really neat things going on. Um, the coyote is an interesting one in that technically the coyote was, as far as we could tell, that was never really a a resident species on the East Coast, but it's kind of moved in and taken over somewhat um, the niche of uh, the wolf. It can't take down big ungulates, but it, it can take down a deer that's injured or not that healthy. Um, it, can, it can take down deer in the winter when there's deep snow and the coyotes can stay on top of a, of a crust that supports them. Um, but uh, so that's kind of a new species. And uh, I, I, I find that kind of exciting because there's not a lot of top of the food chain predators on Long Island. We, we used to have wolves on Long Island. We used to have bobcat on Long Island. And both of those species were um, right away, they put a bounty on them. We got to shoot them and trap them and poison them. We declared war on those species. Um, so they've made a comeback and, um, you know, it's controversial. We're going to, you know, we, we forget that people have been living with coyotes, you know, in Chicago for <laughs> decades. Um, I think we could figure it out too, but people are really anxious about that. It's a new, it's a new thing. Um, so yeah, some neat stuff happening. Yeah. Anybody have any comments or questions? Uh, sorry, I, I, I'm Ken. I joined late because I was on a call with China. I apologize. <laughs> I, I, did I miss the whole issue about the various trails and so forth that there's a there's there's a guide or we could you know if we like to go hiking that in different parts of you know from East Hampton or Amagansett or Nepeak or was there some kind of book that was was brought up and uh, <laughs> where did we find that book? Yes. So um, the book that I had picked up during quarantine that like prompted my whole interest in this is the Trail Guide to the South Fork with a natural history. It was published by the Southampton Press. Um, we, can we find that at Bookhampton or? Yeah, um, you can, if depend on where you live, you did Martell's uh, on the highway in Montauk usually carries it. And um, I'm a big fan of Canio's. That's an independent bookstore in Sag Harbor. Canio's. Definitely. Canios, yeah, right on the main street um, going into Sag Harbor. So it's by um, Otter Pond, actually. What, what's um, the name of the book again? A Trail Guide to the South Fork. And um, so that was published in 2003. Oh. And uh, there are about 35 trails described in there. Um, east of the Shinnecock Canal. Now to give you an idea of another positive thing, um, because we were that right around that time, we got enabling legislation from the state to have a, um, a real estate transfer tax. 
Right. And uh, that that was a go, and and we got all set up for that. So that the trail system has doubled since 2003. Um, and I need to update that book, but it's a good start. And uh, Rick Whalen, who a lot of you will know um, if you're into trails, is, uh, is, is working on a book. He'll hopefully come out with that sometime in the next year or two. That's more of a, a history of East Hampton, but he covers a lot of the, a lot of the trail system as well. And I, you know, that should be a great book. And when will you begin updating? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's been on the back burner for uh, seven years. Um, and it's still on the back burner, unfortunately. Um, yeah, I don't know. Is the town, to each town, that they have their own little, you know, mimeograph? maps of the of the trails also or, or you can you can get um a map of east hampton from the uh from on the east hampton town website and i believe you can do the same thing with uh southampton town yeah they went out and they you know gps to everything and i think they created a map that you can un download on on their website okay thank you mm -hmm. Yep. Can I ask another question about, I don't know, did you talk about the red fox? I used to see them all the time. Sometimes I used to have someone come stay on my porch, you know, and then, then they disappeared. Was there some kind of like disease or something or? Yeah, so the, so the red fox um, has a, I was mentioning that we don't have a lot of apex predators on Long Island. Um, the fox is really more of an omnivore. It's not really uh, an apex predator. So um, there's nothing really that, 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 that controls the population of red foxes um, directly. And so they get, as the population grows, they get a, um, a density dependent disease called sarcoptic mange. And it's, it's a skin disease. And you'll see them, uh, they look, they don't really look like a fox. Like they'll have just this a wire-like tail with no fur on it, for example. Um, so the sarcoptic mange doesn't kill them, but it uh, taxes their immune system so badly that um, they succumb to other diseases that they would normally be able to fend off if they were healthy and the population just crashes. So it's a boom and bust cycle. And um, that's what we see here on Long Island. Now that should change when the coyotes uh, move into the area. And I, I mentioned earlier that we, we, we now have a couple of breeding pairs of coyotes on Long Island. They're very rare, they're, they're, they're definitely not all over the place, but they, they are coming. And the coyotes, um, it seems in the literature from research, reading the research on this, the coyotes don't necessarily prey on the foxes, but they, uh, they avoid, the foxes will avoid coyote territories to some extent. So they won't produce as many young and they won't get into that that boom and bust cycle, it'll be more leveled off, um, which hopefully will happen with the raccoon as well, with the arrival of the coyote. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Uh, you know, is, there, is there like, like is there like a, a club or something that you know you can walk with someone i mean that you know that they actually have scheduled walks that you know, oh yeah yeah we, we have uh we have a very active trails uh group out here um there's uh southampton has a trails uh southampton trails preservation society they they have uh a couple of hikes every week and then east hampton uh has the same kind of a thing yeah how do you find them 
Uh, just Google either name and you'll you'll go to their website. They have all that stuff posted. You could you could join as a member and it'll send you. Um, what is the website? Southampton Trails and East Hampton Trails. Two different things. You can Google that and you'll you'll get to their websites. Thank you. Okay. Great. Good. Thank you. So, right. Mike, if the sequel or the follow-up is on the back burner, then what's next for you? What are you looking towards? Uh, in the um, next years? Well, nothing, um, nothing really trails related. Uh, I just uh, did a draft that some friends are checking out for uh, edits and such. It's a it's a river otter. Um, survey manual. It's about 25 pages. And um, I do, I train a lot of people to help out survey or, or monitor for changes in the distribution of otters on Long Island. And, um, and we've also shifted a little bit just last year to, to also include um, trying to pin down where otters are crossing the road and trying to mitigate where they're getting hit by cars. Uh, so we just did our first mitigation project out in Eastport this summer. I built a, uh, what, what was happening there, every situation is a little different, but what was happening there is uh, they were running into this vertical dam and they couldn't go around the dam without crossing a road that was on top of the dam. And so one got hit by a car. Um, so uh, I made a simple staircase out of cinder blocks. Uh, it, was, it was maybe a four and a half to five foot dam. So it needed a fair number of cinder blocks, but uh, it just had to be one cinder block wide. And, uh, and then I set up a video camera. This, this is something new for me. I, I never tried doing this. Otters are very curious and they're very playful. And um, I thought that they would really get into running up and down the stairway actually, um, even though it has water running down it. So sure enough, uh, within a couple of weeks, um, I got a nice video of two otters uh, approaching the dam from the pond side. One went down the staircase, the other didn't really uh, like it and circled back out of the frame. And then the, the other otter came back up the stairway into the pond, disappeared out of the frame. And then the two of them came back together with the one sniffing all around and still not sure of the whole thing, but she eventually went down. So that was, that was kind of fun. So doing more of that. Anyway, the, um, um, the, 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 the object of the manual was, was the things I cover in a workshop to train people with a lot of photographs and, um, and a lot of specific information about where to look, when to look, what to look for, and how to distinguish otter sign from the sign of other animals that you could mistake for. So the number one is raccoon. I get a lot of photographs of raccoon tracks. So I really got into detail of how to, how to easily uh, identify the raccoon versus the otter. And then there's a couple other species that, that might surprise some of you. Um, one, well, both of these particular species are, the, 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 the width of the trail is, is very similar and the number of toes is very similar to uh, otter. And they have the tail drag, which I think was the thing that ke people keyed into. And so one was uh, muskrat, and the other was uh, a snapping turtle, a big snapping turtle that were mistaken for uh, River Otter sign. And um, yeah, these were these were knowledgeable people. Uh, one, the, the guy that took the photographs of the muskrat is a uh, wildlife biologist. Um, 
but you know, we all have our our various um, areas of expertise. And um, he wasn't a hundred percent sure, but he thought it would be River Otter. But I explained why that. Was. Anyway, that's all in there, and um, I think it's going to be a fun read for people who who like to get into the outdoors and want to do something more than hike around. They want they want to actually contribute to something. Yeah, to more conservation efforts. Like yeah, you said, so, like you enjoy the outdoors now, participate at this. Yeah. like make that bridge right. Yeah. So right. we, we've launched, uh, Sea Tuck has, has uh, in, the, in the last three years, we've launched a whole series of citizen science projects. Um, uh, everything from uh, checking for ribbon, river herring sign, which you're looking for the river herring at a certain time of the year, at a certain tide in these tidal creeks, um, to uh, the otter survey, the coyote, um, study and uh, we have a bat survey. We have a diamondback terrapin survey, which is a really beautiful turtle that lives in the bays, not in not in the ocean. It's not a sea turtle, um, but it, it lives in sort of brackish water in the bays. And we're trying to pin down the distribution uh, on Long Island here. So they were. We, you were allowed to trap them for food. And um, that's one thing that was happening. Road kills was another problem. And then um, nest uh, uh, predation by raccoons was another problem. So we want to pin down the, the, the important nesting areas and try and protect them. We've got some projects to uh, funnel them to safe passages to get off uh, to where they have to cross the road. And, uh, oh, the other one is uh, horseshoe crabs. So they come in to lay eggs in, in uh, May and June. And we're identifying where those key egg laying sites are. That's right at the high tide and sandy soil generally. So these are participants. So if people were interested in assisting with the study, like in their own neighborhood, they could go yeah. on to the yeah. website and find out how they can. Yeah, there's information well, about what we want them to do. And then there's a, um, they can download this app and they can put all the information in if they see. And this year, um, working on launching another project that's going to be a Long Island mammal survey. And, you know, everybody, uh, not everybody, a lot of people have, um, these remote trail cameras they're called. So you set these up, you lash it onto a tree, yep. you know, what's in my backyard. And um, I've noticed this from doing the otter research that a lot of my volunteers really got into this and they documented awesome information. Uh, for example, they've pinned exactly down where the otters cross a road where we've had a road kill. And um, we can put up uh, some mitigation there, but I needed to know exactly where they're crossing the road. It wasn't a dam situation. Uh, it was a different situation. They were crossing from a pond going overland to the nearest tidal creek. And uh, I knew within 50 yards where they crossed the road, but to go to the town and say, we need to do something about the road configuration here. I have to know exactly where that is. Um, yeah, so we're gonna tap into that and uh, update the publication that was done in the 1960s, uh, Mammals of Long Island, New York by Paul Connor. So that's, that's gonna be really cool. And I think we're gonna get a lot of, um, a lot of people who haven't been involved in uh, some of this other survey work. And we're also, I think we're gonna get a lot of like high school groups getting involved in this because uh, it's really fun. We're trying to figure out what was that that just went by, you know? Yeah. 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 And just a way to bring it more, you know, like it's happening in our own backyards, you know, and we can do something yeah. about it and help, yeah. you know, a larger cause, uh, help the ecosystem is really neat too. So, yeah, because there's a lot of things that go through our backyard in the middle of the night. We have no idea. Right. Yeah. You know? 
except our motion cameras that go off. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Joan, I think you uh, had a question. You had your hand raised. Yes, I have a question for you, Mike. Uh, for those people who are just enjoying the the water and the the woods, you know, kayakers, canoers, what do you uh, what what do you wish they wouldn't do? <laughs> I wouldn't what, do. You know, what what do you like? Obviously, don't litter. You know, but right, litter, right, it, right. Yeah. Well, the first thing that comes to mind is. Um, is getting too close to uh, nesting areas. Um, the, uh, the osprey actually are so habituated to the people that generally that's not an issue, but, but it, I've noticed that, you know, like, like humans and dogs, you know, animals have personalities. So some osprey are very skittish. And there's a, there's a point in time and a, and a certain day when it's cold or rainy, you know, it's, it, may be, it may be in May and they're still incubating eggs or they have uh, very small chicks that, that really need to be under those conditions. They really need to be, um, you know, under, the, under one of the adults out of the elements. Yeah, it's not a good idea to, and, and it's pretty obvious that you've disturbed it because the, the adult flushes off the nest and they circle around and make a lot of noise mm -hmm. and you just need to back off. This is a big problem though, um, potential problem with, with the bald eel nesting sites um, because that's kind of a new thing here and we get, you know, these these passionate wildlife photographers that got to get that perfect shot of the bald eagle and the chicks in the nest and duh, you know, uh, <laughs> you're disturbing the nest. Um, so yeah, that's the problem. That's the problem. And I have, uh, I have um, Steve Biasetti, who some of you would know, um, he's a really excellent naturalist. He's really, a, super birder and he he's he's um really it's re it really irks him that he's leading a birding trip with birders and they're getting too close to you know like the snowy owl or or, or another species that's quite unusual and secretive and he warns them about it but they they can't help themselves they've got to They've got to get that National Geographic shot, which is just going to be on their Facebook page. Big deal. You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, I was thinking about um, kayakers coming upon like a beaver dam. Advice, like stay away, don't go over. No, no, that, 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 that's not a problem. Uh, you know, that's... Uh, not on Long Island, you know, we, we, we had one beaver uh, in East Hampton for, hmm, I think like it was here for like six or seven years. The dam it made wasn't, wasn't one you would paddle over. It was a tiny little like mosquito ditch kind of size thing. But um, yeah, elsewhere, um, you've got to slide your canoe over obviously. So, uh, it's usually the easiest way to get over the dam because there's usually a lot of alders and thickets on the side. Yeah, that's that's not a problem. Uh, the beavers are really active at night, and and yeah, they they don't they're not like a wilderness animal. You know, they're in a lot of developed areas. So. Well, we're just coming up on our time. Um, so if there's one last question, okay. well, thank you everyone for joining us tonight and a special thank you to you, Mike, um, for chatting with us too. Sure. Uh, no you can stay tuned to our website, easthamptonhistory.org for more information about our upcoming events and programs. And please consider making a donation which supports free outreach programs such as this one. And everyone have a wonderful evening and stay safe and stay healthy. All right. Have a good and happy time. new year, everyone. Happy Still close enough to that. Bye. Bye now. Yeah.